my second talk in the same sitting i have two consecutive ones so i think uh, you know when it comes to the newer diagnostic tools and that's what i wanted to discuss uh, i think uh, topography still remains one of the most important uh, you know things and we should not ignore it even though you know shine plug and oct based imaging is all available but a good uh, topography which is placido based still remains a very very important tool and in fact all the topo guided treatments that we do are all based on um, placido and not on pentacam based or other uh, captures so a good topography is a must and uh, beyond that of course we all understand the importance of pachymetry and how we choose a procedure based on patient's pachymetry and then uh, the limits of the surgery we should all understand prk i would not go beyond 100 microns and not leave a bed less than 350 microns at the least and maybe much more than that and then for cry lasik and smile frankly the criteria is remain the same although in smile you have the additional comfort of a intact cap uh, so that gives added benefit and uh, then keratometry of course is important because you would if you are using a micro keratome you have a very steep cornea or a very flat cornea and then the range of correction that you might want to do on a very flat cornea may be limited or on a hyperopic correction of steeper cornea it may be limited so always great to look at the keratometry very carefully and then today i would not operate i mean i have been using epithelium thickness mapping for last 5 6 years and i think it's a must uh, for every uh, practice of course if you uh, you know you are starting out you can bypass this for a couple of years but gradually you would want to add that it adds a lot of information not only in the pre operative workup but also in the way your patients heal uh, post operatively and sometimes when you have a, a, a unexpected results you can actually see things on the epithelium which will explain what you where you went wrong picking up suspect corneas also i think the epithelium mapping is very very useful so if you have an inferior steep island and uh, you know you want to compare that to your you'll quickly look at the epithelium maps and you may be able to pick up why that may be there and you may pick up uh, a subtle or even advanced uh, keratoconus in a much better way and some corneas which are showing almost no changes on other investigations may start showing a very little uh, epithelium thinning on the apex and compensatory hypertrophy superiorly as is evident now this is of course an advanced case but you may see very subtle thinning here of by few microns and you on the cone and you may see comp sensory hypertrophy around and that can really tell you if some patients are beginning to develop uh, early uh, keratoconus and then you might avoid uh, procedures or do a prk extra kind of a procedure and then of course uh, when it comes to you know understanding the post operative outcomes epithelium mapping has been very very useful uh, you can get uh, very nice uh, ideas of how the epithelium is healing uh, post pale lasik prk and smile and they vary between the three of them but they help you understand and convince patients if they are getting unexpected visual outcomes of course uh, then wappage case and this slide is thanks to dr rishi swarup here for contact lens uh, wappage and it might look like um, you know a keratoconus but actually it's pretty much the opposite because you'll see epithelial hypertrophy instead of uh, epithelial thinning on the cone but on on a pentacam it might look similar then uh, the other modality which has really helped us uh, today is abrometry and eye trace is one of them there is also the nidec opt scan and a few other abrometers which are available they've really helped us uh, understand uh, the way front and uh, while you might not use abrometry assisted treatments uh, as much now as you did in the past but to understand your refractive and cataract cases this is a very very useful tool and uh, it does both a corneal topography and an abrometry and then puts them together and separates out the lenticular and the corneal uh, wavefront so it knows whether what aberrations are coming from the cornea and which are coming from the um, internal uh, opt optics of the eye so it's been very useful i will not go into the details but this is one index which i use a lot in my refractive surgery today there are patients who are in for refractive surgery and if their dysfunctional lens index is very low for example a patient with an absolutely clear crystalline lens would have say 10 and uh, in a suspect you know you might have like a 7 or 8 but if it is showing something low than lower than 5 or in the range of 1 or 2 and some of these patients who come in for icls with very high refractive errors they tend to have a very poor dysfunctional lens index they are not improving to like 68 beyond 618 and you may actually opt for a refractive lens exchange instead of an icl procedure there and you can actually predict to the patient if he is likely to get a great outcome so i was probably i have a case to show i'll just show you that this was one patient minus 20 in the right eye with 3 and a half cylinder left is 5 and a half with one cylinder and um, bcv in the right was only improving to 636 and patient said i've always had poor vision in this eye and obviously with the anisometropia there and you can see that the pachy is really small so this patient is not fit for any kind of laser based procedure but has a stable pachymetry over a few years so uh, we thought uh, this was the epithelium maps and uh, here we saw that the dysfunctional lens index in one eye that was the left eye was 
10 whereas the otherwise eye is 1.21 so um, you know i'm sure you can now understand the importance in in the eye with the 10 we decided to go with an icl and in the fellow eye which was only 1.21 we knew that patient will not do well we you know easily went ahead with a refractive lens exchange and uh, once the patient was through uh, patient did extremely well um, this was the biometry now this is the post-op outcome of the first eye and not only did the patient achieve an index of 10 after the clear lens extraction obviously but also this was a fellow eye and this patient went on to actually become 69 in this eye so it was yeah i think that slide is overlying here i mean here this patient actually got a 69 from 636 so it really helps for us to choose patients this is only one of the indications that eye trace helps you with or a good aperometer so Again, uh, you know, age of the patient may decide what procedure you want to offer and uh, refractive errors you can choose. We've already discussed this, so customization options, you look at the ocular surface and uh, enhancements are now possible with almost all of them. I will not go into the details and other speakers are going to cover that. So what has been covered, I'm going to just leave out. For extra procedures, I only limit myself to Smile Extra, which works really well in my hands for suspect corneas as well as for very high corrections, I use uh, Smile Extra. That gives you that added layer of safety because even Smile has very rare uh, possibilities of ectasia. And uh, we have access to Aura and uh, Corvus, which have gone, I don't have experience with it, so I'm not going to talk on it, but one of our speakers will. So I think uh, trying to finish off, yes, biometry is one thing which I do for every patient who comes for refractive surgery. It helps you record the axial length and also may various other things, the white to white, and it helps in many ways. So, and also in post-op follow-ups, like five years, 10 years down the line, if patient comes with a progression of uh, myopia, you can quickly look at the axial length and tell them if you know you had a change in axial length and then they're quite convinced. So a lot of new other diagnostics are available. The MS-39, which is spoken about a lot, Bowman's analysis, OCAS, and the confocal microscopy so there's no end to what we can do and uh, i'll stop here with a final word so no one modality is perfect for every situation and uh, i think understanding each patient's needs by talking to them and understanding their current prescription and everything is critical and all modalities frankly have a place and all modalities are actually very good so we can't call one as better than the other for everything and we have to choose what's good for a particular situation and i think smile has gained in a big way on lasik while prk still holds its own and fake lenses have come in a big way also and i think once hyperopic smile becomes available the indications for lasik may go further down which is already quite 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 less so i think with that i'll stop thank you so much and uh, and rishi who's going to speak next thanks